other than two presentations. So it's all one presentation, really. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. That's so, fine. And the first slide shows you, I suppose, the theater of operations for me. Um, it can be European wide. Most of my work is in Ireland, although I've done some investigations offshore as well. And the map there that you see is one of the very latest megalithic maps of Europe, although there's a current project to uh, improve on that. And that is underway as well at a European level. But what you see there are a high density of dots, each representing a megalithic monument. A megalithic means large stone, obviously. Yeah. And we have many, many thousands of these monuments scattered across the whole of Northwest Europe, especially. And last month, actually, I was down in the south of Spain and north of uh, Malaga, the Antequera uh, megalithic tomb complex is well worth a visit. And that's just a frontal shot of the largest dolmen, as they call them, although that's not a term we use, uh, which is a megalithic tomb which dates to about 3800 BC. Wow. Uh, so extraordinarily early in the megalithic tradition. And what you've got there are the large entrance features, a passage into a burial chamber. And what's fascinating about this particular monument is that when you're inside looking out, the orientation and viewpoint is on a particular mountain about say eight or nine kilometers away, which presents a profile of a human face in recline. And it is extraordinary that they chose this particular location for the tomb uh, so that when you view the monument in that particular direction, um, it is facing this human face, anthropomorphic, uh, so that the mountain itself in the distance is part of the ritual landscape, the archaeological landscape of the tomb itself. So that's just a taster. Um, the next slide shows you the timeline in which we operate in archaeology particularly. And down the left-hand column, you've got Mesolithic, Neolithic, Bronze Age, Iron Age, Early Medieval. Um, the one at the bottom, early medieval, is the transition from prehistoric into historic. And that means before writing began, when writing began. If you look at the time frames for Mesolithic, that's extraordinarily early. In fact, we've now redated that to nearly 9000 BC for the island of Ireland. The Neolithic or New Stone Age divided up into three sections. And you can see that in broad terms, they're roughly about five, six hundred uh, years in terms of depth, early, middle, and late. Bronze Age, Iron Age, all reflecting the introduction of metal, in a sense. Um, what's important about archaeoastronomy and cultural astronomy is that we don't have the written record when it comes to Northwest Europe. So therefore, we have to make educated guesses, inferences, and sometimes conjecture, uh, which can be a high-risk uh, way of doing things. And I just threw in this because at the moment we have in Trinity College Dublin running a brand new exhibition for the Book of Kells, regarded as Ireland's greatest literary treasury, treasure. And it was started in the island of uh, Iona and came to Ireland to flee or bring it safely to Ireland away from the Norse invaders of that part of the world up in the north of Scotland. And there it resides now in, since the 17th century in Trinity College. But this book written around the 8th century is regarded as a metaphor for the transition from pagan to Christianity. And we have older writing going back to the 5th century, uh, believe it or not, um, but I don't have that example here. Um, so that's really to make the point that before the early medieval, we do not have the written word, so we don't have written evidence. So everything has to be inferred from the monuments and the archaeological excavations and what they retrieve. Um, an earlier form of writing, if you could call it that, is Ogham or Oam. And in Ireland, we've got about 400 of these stones, and these date to about the 5th, 6th century. So just before writing came in, or in parallel with, Notice the grooves on the stones and notice the distribution map. We've got about 400 on the island of Ireland, but there's also a collection in Cornwall, Wales, and up into Scotland as well. And what these stones show us, and they have been decoded, they are engraved along the spine of the columns. And you can see that the length and spacing of the lines vary. 
And this is an early form of writing and it's been decoded and the alphabet is now known to us. And it tells us that these stones commemorate individual people or names in every case. So that was their function. And so they're an important source. So behind the Ogham stones and the era of that, we have got no written evidence at all. If we go off island and outside the Irish tradition or the British tradition, and you go to the Babylonian tradition, um, there is one very important discovery made in Iraq around, I think, 1880 or 1890. And this was a tiny jasper cylinder seal. And it measures no more than about 10 centimeters in height. It is very small and you can see the original on the left. And what the British Museum have cleverly done is they have rolled this cylinder on a bed of wax and they have lifted from the wall of the cylinder this incredible impression. And if you notice what's obvious on this is down the right hand side, you've got cuneiform text. So here you have a very ancient script or pictogram, if you wish, and that has been decoded as well. And astronomically, there is embedded in this particular image uh, a great indicator of the importance of the lunar phase and the crescent phase of the moon. And generally, in terms of lunar studies in prehistory, it is the first appearance of the new crescent that signals all sorts of interesting and important things, including for calendar and timekeeping. But what you have in the engraving is a procession towards a deified god king who is seated on a throne. And if you look at the throne, the back right hand leg of the throne is carved in the leg of a bull. And it is well known that there is a direct connect between the horns of a bull and the symbolism symbolically and the crescent shape of the moon. And this does recur throughout a lot of prehistoric um, artifacts for sure. So what you have there is a procession towards the deified king seated on a throne with the symbol of, symbol, uh, symbolizing the moon. And this is dated to about 2100 BCE. When we come to Ireland, um, we go back to the Neolithic and the Boyne Valley, and I'll be coming to the Boyne Valley shortly. On one of the mega tombs in the Boyne Valley, which is a gigantic passage tomb <clears throat> known as Nouth. There are three of them. Uh, Newgrange is one of the three. And if you look at this inscribed <clears throat> stone, which is one of the curved stones which surrounds the base of the gigantic cairn, one stone in particular, this one, known as K52 in the sequence of curved stones, they're numbered archaeologically, bears embellishment which is widely regarded scientifically now as symbolizing the synodic phases of the moon. And I'll put my mouse pointer on the stone here. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, I want you to start in the middle where I've got the mouse. And you've got this circular array or, or uh, motif. And this is generally taken to mean the symbolizing of the sun. And what you have are an array of arcs, which number one to two, all the way cyclically around the stone and all the way back to 26, 27, 28 and 29. And you can immediately see that in terms of the lunar count or the symbolic count, this very strongly suggests the phases of the moon as would be observed. And what's very interesting here is that if you look at this, is a laser scan, by the way, so it is hu very hu uh, high density and resolution. Um, let me just go back. I've just hit the wrong one. Have a look at the crescents. And we analyze these by zooming in, and we can infer that the crescents are, in fact, symbolized behind the symbol of the sun. Now, imagine yourself in prehistory and you're looking at the sky and you have no perception of depth or indeed of what is behind what. And to an observer in prehistory, if something disappeared intuitively, logically, it would disappear behind the dominant object. And that is what is depicted here and adds to the evidence that the moon disappeared 
from view. And hence we get this period, this three day typically period of dark sky, dark moon. And then you have the emergence of the new crescent here, number one. So if you also look at this serpentine in the middle of the stone motif, and you count the number of turns, you also get 29. And the synodic cycle can either be 29 or 30. And in terms of prehistory, you know, both occur in terms of the evidence that survives. So this is one of our really most important engraved stones in megalithic art. And what's interesting is that if you count all of the stones in Ireland, which bear megalithic ornament, we have in excess of 70% of the total corpus of megalithic art in Northwest Europe. So something very special was going on on this island in terms of megalithic development and advancement. If I jump to Orkney, you all know the famous Mays Howe Passage tomb. And Mays Howe Passage tomb was built a century or two after Newgrange. Nonetheless, there is clear evidence that there was connections and voyages taking place between the island of Orkney and the Boyne Valley down near Dublin. And artifacts were brought down and there was trade, there was exchange. We have the evidence archeologically. What's really important about Mays Howe is even though it is later than, it has a passage into the mound, which is well recognized as being solstitially aligned on the winter setting sun. So this is an indication that some of these monuments have astronomical alignment. And we'll talk about that in a little more detail in a moment. It's important to also say that not every monument is astronomically aligned, even though a lot of the uh, pundits would wish, wish it to be so, not the case, unfortunately. And my own work on the uh, alignment of passage tombs in Ireland throughout the whole island uh, would indicate that just a small number are astronomically aligned. Others have interesting alignment on other things in the landscape. So that's the distribution map on the right of the passage tomb tradition. Now, what I should also mention here is that in archaeology, we classify or create a topology of tomb types. And there are many different tomb types. But in all of them, and I'll give you the names, they're court tombs, wedge tombs, and then the passage tomb. The passage tomb came latest in the sequence. And in terms of sophistication and ornamentation and importance, they are ranked as being the supreme example of tomb building for a variety of reasons. If we come down to the Boyne Valley, which I've mentioned earlier, uh, Orkney being way up to the north, about 800 kilometers away, and it flabbergasts me to think that in the Neolithic, seagoing voyages were undertaken at that time over that distance. So there was contact, there was exchange, and the artifacts prove it. But here you have a restored monument, passage tomb at Newgrange, 3200 BCE, and if you take a moment to dwell on the architecture of the monument, um, it is gigantic cairn, dimensionally about 90 meters in diameter. Uh, from ground to summit, it's about 12 meters. And surrounding it, you can see some standing stones, a ring of standing stones. And the very latest research on these now indicates or dates these to be contemporary with, I'm just gonna go back for a moment, these surrounding circle of stones are contemporary with the monument itself. So all dating to around 3200 BCE. Why build a monument as big as that to house a small chamber inside in which were interred the cremated remains of, we now have the latest research to indicate an elite so it wasn't everybody who got buried in these tombs. And this research would indicate that at Newgrange, at least, the remains of an elite were being buried. There's also evidence to show from ancient DNA and genomic analysis now, a very controversial theory, 
but backed by the uh, genomic evidence that there was incest practiced in order to probably preserve the royal line. And that has a parallel in Egypt, interestingly. Um, but the references are given uh, and they're, they're at the end of my talk. So inside you have a, a burial chamber, but outside you have this incredible frontage of quartz. Now, the restoration was carried out in the late 60s and early 70s by Professor O'Kelly. And controversially, he reinstated the whole mound, much of which had collapsed, out onto the ground between where you see the frontage now and the Ring of Standing Stones. And he took the bold decision to put reinforced concrete behind to, or to basically hold the monument from future collapse. And then he faced the monument with all of the quartz that was found on the site. So none of that quartz and indeed the granite boulders which are dotted into it uh, were imported. Everything on site was restored. A lot of people find difficulty with this frontage, but internally the architecture is secure. The right hand side map shows you a distribution map of these passage tombs. And as I said, you had court tombs, a different architecture. You had wedge tombs, a different architecture. And then you had the passage tombs. There's a little bit of overlap chronologically, but the passage tombs by far and away are the superior or crew, a premier crew, if you like, of the passage to of the tomb building era. The black dots show you about 220 which survive on the island. The red dots show you those which have an indicated astronomical alignment of interest. And we'll chat about that in a moment. But outside, you have an entrance as you go into this tomb. Now, there is no other tomb on the island as sophisticated and embellished as this. And outside, you also have shadow casting phenomena, which I'm simulating here. So that seasonally at key times in the year, depending on the alignment of the sun, the shadows are cast by the standing stone one after the other onto the curved stone at the entrance. So that is one interesting phenomenon. And I've published a paper on that, which you can easily get now on the reference list called shadow casting phenomena at Newgrange. But what you have here is a symbolically important entrance and look at the sophistication of the carving on this stone. 5,200 years old, a little bit eroded by weathering, uh, but still holding its own. And it gets covered at night, you would be glad to hear, with protective covers. You have a door stone on the right-hand side. You can see that there with my mouse pointer. And then you have an entrance passageway. And that leads for 19 meters inside the tomb to a burial chamber. Overhead, you have a lintel stone. And most importantly, you have an additional opening called the roof box. And that is a slot which, from when you're inside the tomb, you can look out at ground level and see the horizon. Now, no other tomb on the island, or indeed in Europe, has such a construct. This is unique. And I'll take you next on a journey into the tomb. And this is a, a laser scan. And we'll take a walk through and you'll get the idea of what a passage grave or tomb looks like as you climb through the doorway and up the passage for 19 meters. And you have orthostats or standing stones holding up the roof and lintels. And now we're entering the burial chamber And the shape of the, the ground plan of, or the shape of the burial chamber is cruciform or cross-shaped, a right-hand recess, an end recess. And a left-hand recess with a basin stone, which were the places they deposited these interred remains. And then you've got the incredible architecture of a corbelled roof with a capstone sealing off the entrance. Now, floor to ceiling, that is six meters high. A little bit higher than your average living room, I guess. What's also amazing is that the corbelled roof slab stones are inclined so that rainwater drains away outside the chamber. 
And there are also, as was discovered during the excavations, grooves, which are rainwater or gutter channels. No other tomb ever excavated has shown the uh, mechanism of taking water away from a tomb in such a manner. So incredible sophistication, and it still stands and has never, never subsided. When we come to look at Newgrange and indeed Mace Howe, the one I just uh, signposted earlier, um, we immediately turn our attention to seasons and sky and the movement of the sun. Because Mace Howe being a British example, and there are many others in Britain, and then several in Ireland, where there is an interest in terms of orientating the monument towards key celestial events on the horizon. Now, the obvious one is the sun, and the sun being the supreme celestial body, it makes sense that in prehistory, uh, orientating and, shall we say, directing monuments in certain cases towards key points in the solar year would probably have been important, religiously, ritually, ceremonially. And there I've just taken a sort of a, a view of the sky compressed into through the year, and the sun's arc between the winter solstice, which we have just left, by the way, December 21. So we're only about two weeks after the solstice. And the arc of the sun in these latitudes is incredibly low. So when you're driving or cycling, you are utterly blinded. And any sharp day where there's a clear sky, we all notice that, of course. And that is the turning point or limiting point for the sun's position, apparent position on the horizon. If you go to the other extreme, the summer solstice, way up in June in the Northern Hemisphere, there is the, for this latitude, the arc of the sun in the sky there. So that enormous swing, which for the latitude of Britain and Ireland approximates to almost 90 degrees, uh, which is an incredible amount of movement between winter solstice and sunrise, and also sunset. And this begs the question, were tombs aligned on the winter solstice only? Were they aligned on the summer solstice? Were they aligned on divisions between the solstices and even subdivisions controversially? Well, we'll have a quick chat about that in a moment, but that diagram I think is very self-explanatory. If we now look at Newgrange, um, we have come through a period of research at Newgrange, which was unprecedented astronomically. Um, it followed, I guess, a couple of presentations I did and a bit of writing I did, and then we had a major conference in Dublin. And following the conference, which was thematically sort of uh, focused on cosmology and skyscape and archeology span and archeoastronomy, um, the chief archeologist thought that a conference would be uh, well attended, and it was, but they then decided to fund research at Newgrange during the period of COVID. And it was the manager of the Newgrange Centre, Claire Tuffy, my great colleague, who suggested that if we're gonna be closed for COVID and no visitors are allowed into the chamber, especially at Solstice, can we do research to take advantage of the vacant tomb? And the chief archeologist immediately grabbed it with both hands and we had a meeting, we had discussions, and a major research project was launched, which used video cameras, digital cameras, and we installed them. And there was an incredible um, effort in terms of capturing the solstice. For the very first time, a video camera was installed in the roof box so that you had a view out towards the horizon of the rising sun at the winter solstice as seen for the very first time. And this was transmitted live in subsequent web broadcasts and live streams, which I've been privileged to be part of. I've also published in um, Archaeology Ireland the preliminary results of the research project. And on the left there, you see that it made the cover, which is always a great thing, actually. Um, and what is solstice? Um, it's a phenomenon which obviously is worldwide for both hemispheres and culturally in prehistory is well known to have been ceremoniously and ritually marked uh, by festives, gatherings, 
You can take Stonehenge in Britain as a classic example with enormous crowds gathering at both solstices. For a long time, solstice at Stonehenge was celebrating the summer solstice. And I think it was archeological investigation of the great trilithons discovered through micro laser scanning that one side of the approach into, the, into Stonehenge was uh, unrendered and the other was very rendered in terms of micro micro polishing and that suggested strongly that the view direct the view direction of interest should be the setting sun at the winter solstice at stonehenge but regardless uh, people gather for the sun in the summertime and they gather for the sun in the winter time at stonehenge here at newgrange and i've just constructed this typical diagram of what the solstice is and if you start to observe the sun from a particular location, you're in a fixed position and you're looking at your horizon. And ideally you've got some reference markers that can be mountains, they can be trees, as long as they're in the distance. And you make a note, a mental note of the movement of the sun, the apparent movement of the sun on the horizon. You will notice that 20 days out, which is where my mouse is, the sun is at 128 and a half degrees. 15 days out, it has, in the period of five days, moved two or three diameters. In another five days, that movement or apparent movement is less. In the next five days, it is considerably less. And clearly, all to do with the axial tilt and other factors. And then when you get to the winter solstice itself, um, you have several days on which you will have no apparent movement of the sun to the naked eye. Clearly, if you have a telescope on it, you would see it shift, but not with the naked eye. And what's also interesting with this diagram here is that if you take time into consideration and go back 5,000 years, the changes in the tilt of the Earth's axis, obliquity, makes or has an effect. And in prehistory, the sun would have risen about little more than two solar diameters to the right of its present position if you're talking about the northern hemisphere and that's shown in the next slide where we have this obliquity cycle which is 41,000 years long to complete we're about halfway through that cycle at the moment and the extreme limits between obliquity at one end of the maximum and the next minimum is about 1.6 degrees and it varies from 22 and a half to just a little over 24. Even though angularly that is quite small, that is sufficient to produce quite an effect on sunrise apparent position rising and indeed setting. And what I've done here is I've simulated the view through the roof box. Now on the right top, you see looking inwards uh, into the chamber from the outside. So that is the actual opening, which was specially constructed. Here's an interesting point about this roof box. The floor of the lintel, if you wish, has scratch marks. And they discovered during excavation one large quartz block, which was inserted into that opening there suggesting because of scratch marks across the entire length of the lintel that other quartz blocks which were missing would have been used to block up or close off that roof box periodically and the hunt has been on for many years to find the remaining quartz blocks they haven't been found but one certainly was and what's this telling us it's telling us that in the neolithic the users of the tomb had the power ritually to control the light. So light, sunlight, solstice, burial, they're all interrelated and they're all controlled or capable of being controlled or manipulated by the insertion and removal of the quartz blocks. Quartz being a very special mineral was sourced in County Wicklow. 80 kilometers to the south on the mountains. 
you remember that slide of the frontage of New Grange? All of that quartz was brought a distance of over 80 kilometers up to New Grange. Now that is one considerable effort, irrespective of the effort that went into building the huge tomb itself. They also went to the coast, uh, to the northeast of New Grange to procure different kinds of geology or lithics, uh, especially granite cobbles, and they were brought down. So great attention and interest was given to particular stone types and color, and especially quartz. Quartz is generally regarded as having been imbued in prehistory with enormous religious cultural symbolism. It meant something. So the bottom diagram there shows you uh, the view through the tomb um, as it is now, AD 2000, and then 5,000 years ago. And that simulation I've created using a blend of, you know, astronomical software and, you know, uh, photographic imagery of the, the view outwards. So we can actually tell a lot about what went on then compared to now. The obliquity cycle will be well known to you. And we are currently about halfway through that cycle. Now, the problem is that when Newgrange was built, you're talking about 5,000 years ago, so where my mouse is, the sun was there in the obliquity cycle. And between then and now, it has moved about two diameters, a little more than two diameters in azimuth. And it will continue, that cycle, it will continue up until 11, 12,000 AD. So at the moment we were, sorry, I, I, yeah, sorry, that's uh, going the wrong way on this graph. So about 5,000 years ago, the sun was there. It's here now. And we are losing the sun at Newgrange. And if you go back to that previous image, you'll notice that currently the track of the sun when viewed from the burial chamber is very much to the left-hand side of the window or roof box. In the Neolithic, it would have been much more central. So they were targeting and aligning the passage on the sun as it was rising then. And our knowledge of astronomy does allow us to make these corrections and changes. So Newgrange, the bad news is, will go dark, I would reckon, in a couple of thousand years, which is why I've suspended my retirement. <laughs> I have to be here to see the darkness. <laughs> anyway, that will happen, and it's inevitable, and the heritage people don't want to know. <laughs> bad news. And here we have a, a little simulation which shows you here I want to put a nail in the coffin of the uh, precisionists who often argue that in the Neolithic there were precise astronomers who practiced, you know, sky watching and they may well have done so. But all you need is reference markers on the horizon and you need a memory. And once you've got those two factors, you will intuitively know year after year where the limit of the rising or setting sun will be, winter or summer solstice. It's actually quite easy. Conveniently at Newgrange, there is in the distance an array of conifers there. And I've suggested again to the heritage bodies that we need to put a preservation order on these trees mm. forever. The reason being, when I play this, you will see where the sun rises in the present day, about here, and 5,000 years or so ago in the Neolithic. So bottom, you've got the New Grange Neolithic sunrise. Top, you've got the present day. And you've got that shift due to the change in obliquity. All of which we can easily factor into any investigation that we carry out at a site. I think that makes the point clear and rather nice. Mm, indeed. So those trees have to stay. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of um, 
culture in Ireland, we have a particular interest in the solstice. And we also have a particular interest in drinking. <laughs> and someone created that. I think it had to be. Anybody has it to guess who might have drawn that? No. Yes. Kronig? Was the name Kronig? I've lost the I've lost the credit for it. <laughs> but well, it's obviously uh, it's one of the Simpsons. So it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, it is, yeah. <laughs> you're dead right. You're dead right. So, but it actually makes a nice point that you know here we have ceremony, time of year, significance, and solar illumination. But more seriously, part of the research and one of the results of the research project, which we were we were conducting in 2020, 21. And then the analysis in 22, 20, I've just written the final report for National Monuments. And hopefully that will become uh, publicly available on their UNESCO World Heritage site soon. Um, I published part of this, but on the left, what you see is a downward view from above, from a nadir pointing digital camera of the solar beam as it illuminates the chamber at winter solstice. And what you've got there, in fact, are two types of light. You have the lesser, which is the ambient light, which is there pretty well all day. But here you have, for a period of about 20 minutes, this shaft of light, which currently, in the current obliquity cycle, is like this. But when, it, when you get a clear sunrise with zero cloud and you get a sharp day, it is spectacular and people inside the chamber just go to pieces emotionally i kid you not it's incredible and to be there on a lottery ticket for the days in question and by the way this occurs the fullest extent of the illumination it does last for about three to four days five days thereafter before it or afterwards it begins to wax or wane and we know that there is light in the chamber for considerably longer but at its peak, you get this phenomenal sun dagger or light beam. Now, what's interesting is on the right hand side, I'm using some of the astronomical simulations, etc., to recreate what the sun path or the sun beam would have looked like in the Neolithic. And we can infer reasonably with certainty that it would have pushed through to the end recess. And a colleague of mine, Professor Tom Ray from the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies, who's an astronomer, has done work on this um, some decades ago, and he has shown that geometrically this would, be, would have been the case as well. So the beam would have been wider, would have penetrated to the end of the recess, and here you see the cruciform architecture, a very special kind of chamber, and here you have the basin stones into which the remains of the interred elite would have been placed, and then you have seasonally, once a year, the removal of the quartz blocks, allowing perhaps the light to penetrate for a period of days. And of course, that raises a big question about probability of all of these tombs. And we can bring in statistics into this at a very basic level or a very high level. And I collaborated with uh, a colleague of mine at Bournemouth University, Dr. Fabio Silva, who's developed some very good software now for analyzing probability. I did the basic histogram and he did it again. Mercifully, we agreed. And he superimposed on my, on my work, his work. And what we see is there a significance test applied to all passage tombs. Now we have 136 where we can measure the orientation because the passages have survived. We can calculate astronomical declination, and that is a probability density analysis of astronomical declination. Have a look at the gray field. The gray field is the one above which we would like to see these blue peaks rise. Generally, they don't. So they are telling us that taken as a whole, the passage tomb tradition doesn't jump off the page in terms of definite probable astronomical alignment. But, and it's a big but, on the other side, you have one-offs. And Newgrange, for a variety of reasons, and here you've got, I put in the red line to indicate winter solstice, 
that's equinox and summer solstice and you know you're just beginning to see a hint of significance emerging above randomness which is what i want to say here and um, but archaeologically and structurally we can argue for deliberate intentionality for new grange using a whole range of other factors so that's kind of ending of my new grange presentation and that brings us into what is cultural astronomy, which is my world, I guess. And it's a blend of ancient cosmology. And cosmology is something that you would understand from a modern perspective. And interestingly, cosmology in the modern sense and prehistoric cosmology fundamentally ask the same questions. Where are we in the universe? What is our place in the universe? And in prehistory, it would have been exactly the same. Archaeoastronomy is the tools and the nuts and bolts of analyzing. And then ethnography is all about using evidence from living indigenous cultures who can tell us things about practice and religion and, you know, uh, ceremonies, which have been long lost in many cases. Our methods and our inquiry, I've just listed them very quickly there. Uh, lots of field work, lots of site surveys. And then the computations with astronomical modeling, spatial sciences, I use GIS a lot, I use terrain modeling a lot, and statistics a lot. And then what's, what's it all for? Well, we're trying to add additional layers to archaeology to understand the cultures better. Anthropology, literary software, we've got lots of, we have a very developed literary resource now in terms of publications worldwide, going back over decades. And then we have you, you know, other tools like software, terrain height data, and ultimately, the bottom one, what are we trying to do? We're trying to extract new knowledge from old sites. That is the purpose of our work. The second site I want to show you jumps forward in time to the Iron Age. This one's quickly, uh, just to tell you quickly, um, a phone rang, it was the excavation director of a site near a motorway or on a motorway development project. And they asked me to come and look at the data that they had retrieved from the site itself. And the site is in the townland of Liz Mullen, um, just west of Dublin, along the route of the now M3 motorway. And jumping forward, the site was dated to 545 to 190 BCE. So much, much later than Newgrange. So we're now in the Iron Age. It's worth saying that the Iron Age features not stone monuments, but timber structures. And for that reason, given the time depth, most of the timber structures disappear. They rot. No trace exists above ground. And for that reason, archaeologists love the, ter the term invisible people when they describe the Iron Age societies of that time because it is so hard to get evidence of what they did and where they did it. In this case, um, I'll just show you a flick. I'm just going to flick uh, one slide to the next. There is the motorway completed, and Liz Mullen is the site of interest. So that's after the motorway had finished. Here is the development drawing, and it shows you the alignment design drawing, the civil engineering drawing of the motorway, because I've worked in road design, I've worked on motorways, I've worked on setting out, and I have an intimate understanding of what goes on. Superimposed on the landscape. So greenfield site, motorway design, and in the middle of this motorway, at this particular location, was discovered something truly exciting, regarded by archaeologists as perhaps the greatest find in the recent decades. So that's the site. And if you can imagine the ground is dug out now, um, and if I can draw, if you can imagine a tangent line going across in midair to that side, and you're driving the motorway, if you're in this location on the curve, you are driving underneath the ground that held this site. The site was recorded and then the motorway dug. Now, that caused huge distress to objectors. 
saying the motorway should be rerouted. Uh, this site cannot be destroyed. But from a legal point of view, we have an instrument called uh, record uh, preservation by record. In other words, if a major project like that hits archaeology, all we have to do, all they can do is record it, remove the artifacts if they are removable, and then the project goes ahead. You cannot stop a motorway alignment in mid construction phase and reroute it. Not possible. You'd have to abandon it. There's an aerial view of the motorway take, which is the pale strip. And that's done by topsoil stripping. And you can see, uh, can you see the circular feature? Mm -hmm. Looking very carefully, this is going to become very obvious in a moment. You've got an outer ring and you've got an inner ring. And part of it is outside the motorway take. So in fact, in this, that ground is still in situ, so undisturbed and is left. Topsoil stripping is where the blade of the bulldozer carefully scrapes with beady-eyed archaeologists on their hands and knees moving with the blade to see if anything can be detected. And it was one archaeologist whose scrutinizing careful eye detected a coloration difference in the soil. That was it. That was it. And that coloration difference signified a post hole socket, where in the Iron Age, a couple of centuries before BCE, there would have stood an upright post hole. So the bulldozer was told to stop or to at least you know, scrape very carefully. And as they widened the search, ultimately more than 600 sockets were found in this area. And what you see there in that visual is a computer generated extruding of the post holes above the ground to indicate their position based on the soil coloration difference. That's all there was and the estimated height of the post holes based on the diameter of the sockets. And what you see there is an inner enclosure, a double ring outer enclosure, and an avenue of post holes leading to the outside of the outer ring. So essentially you have an inner ring or closure, a double ring outer and an avenue. They are the elements of this structure. I was the recipient of a phone call from the excavation director to say that they were about to close off the project, but he had one last idea, which was not budgeted. <laughs> and he said, there's no money in this, Frank. And we would like you to look at our data set because I have a sense that maybe there is something astronomically important in the alignment of the avenue. So I asked them to send me the data set, and that's just a tiny sample of each post hole is numbered, and every post hole was surveyed by GPS, so centimeter precision on everything. So an incredible data resource, and it was retrieved by the excavation archaeologists uh, with incredible care. And there you see a planimetric view of what was retrieved. And here you have the inner enclosure. So I navel gazed on this data set for a day or two, and I immediately began to see that the potential of this data was potentially enormous and had not been considered and would have been overlooked had they closed the project. So I asked for the excavation team to meet and I sat down and to use the analogy of the Jaws movie, I said, you're going to need a bigger boat. <laughs> in, terms of, in terms of the inquiry that you have undertaken, um, you are missing out potentially on something very important in terms of the structure and the architecture. And here's a view of the inner and the outer. Have a look at the way they've done this. It's very good. Um, they've used the archaeologists and construction workers to stand along the line of the outer enclosure to give you a sense of scale. And then you have the inside or inner enclosure. So that conveys very well. And here's the bit, by the way, which is still in situ. And here you have a side oblique view of the post hole sockets as they were cleaned out. 
So all you've got are infilled uh, different color soil, which is then removed carefully to reveal the diameter of each socket. There you've got the inner enclosure, but here you have a trench feature. And this trench feature would emerge as being extremely important in a ritual and ceremonial sense. And it, they termed it the slot trench because in it they discovered the burnt remains of animal bones and nuts, particularly hazel, suggesting that this was a place where they deposited or made offerings. And therefore charcoal would have been burned and the, uh, you know, the hazel or the bones would have been thrown in uh, ritually, ceremonially. Now, where I came in on this project was at the very last minute. Have a look at the care and detail of any archaeological excavation. You have topsoil screening at the top right. I'm not going to read all of these, just scan them quickly. You got radiocarbon dating, which gave us the date. Bone analysis, soil analysis, geoarchaeology, retrieval of artifacts like beads or any metals. And the one thing that jumped off the page when I studied all of these was in particular the geoarchaeological, because that specialist said that for a site of this type, it was anomalously clean. There was nothing within the confines of the boundaries of the site. Normally when you get a habitation site, you get rubbish, detritus. No burials, no deposition, no rubbish. This was anomalously clean. And that actually caught my eye significantly. So I suggested that the last element in this research should be geospatial, which would have been my expertise and that I could bring archaeoastronomy, morphology, and metrology analysis to the data set they'd given me. So they were enthusiastic about me doing it, and I went ahead. And I began a series of stepped analyses of all of that spatial data. And the first thing I did was look at where is the geometric center of the complex. So I was able to use the coordinates and uh, for, you know, uh, elemental ma mathematics to come up with the location of the center point of the structure. To my eye as a surveyor, this thing was constructed simply by having a center point and a length of rope to scribe a circle or a series of circles into the ground. And when I looked at my computed um, excavation centers using the various data sets. There was one post hole discovered in the middle of the site, which agreed pretty well with what I had computationally determined. So that gave me the confidence then to go ahead with more analyses. The first thing I did was I looked at the avenue because the post holes in the avenue were so straight and in line, it was clearly evident that these were set out using a length of cord and banging in the post along it. So a bit of uh, mathematics and a bit of statistics and a bit of, um, you know, uh, fit, linearity fitting produced a result which indicated clearly that these post holes were intentionally set along a straight line and were parallel to each other to better than a degree, which was phenomenal would have been easily done in the time using a length of rope as a yardstick. No problem there. I looked at the spacings between the post holes in the in various uh, outer and inner enclosures, and there was good evidence to suggest that they were using some kind of yardstick to space the poles as they went around the enclosure. So it's beginning to build a picture that here we have a structure into which a lot of care and attention was invested to get it right. One of the things that was incredibly important and was a real discovery for me was as a surveyor, if I had nothing but a length of rope and a peg, how would I construct this complex? Well, bang a peg into the middle, as you can see there. And with a length of rope, you could describe a circle, trace it and bang in the posts. Similarly, from the same center, 
you could scribe a circle and bang in your post that way. But what was more important and fascinating was that if you looked at the proportions of the dimensions to each other in the structure, I was able to argue that if you take the inner enclosure as a radius and you scale it up five times exactly, you get the outer enclosure. If you have the length of the rope, you get the width of the avenue. If you have the length of the rope, you get the spacing between the outer posts of the entrance feature. If you quarter the rope, you get the gap space. So here was evidence that, oh, by the way, yes, the distance between the entrance to the inner circle and this slot trench was also half of that unit. So here we have the strong evidence that they were using a length of rope, having it and having it again to control the dimensions of the, of the architecture and also multiplying it by five to get the outer dimension. And all of this sat within a natural saucer-shaped hollow. So the whole thing was scaled so as to fit within the topographic feature. And I did carry out some hypothesis testing and that analysis, which is all written up and in the references I've, I've given you, we can be sure at a 95% confidence level that this was actually what was being done. Finally, the analysis of the axial alignment came into question, which was the original question posed by the archeologists. Nothing was ever thought about the dimensional control, but they did ask about the axial alignment. And because it was kind of close to easterly, they said, is it the equinox? And I said, well, the equinox can be difficult in terms of solar position to determine, and maybe not, but let's look at it. So using the bearing of the avenue and the altitude of the horizon, I was able to calculate then from azimuth to get the astronomical declinations of the sun, upper limb, lower limb, out of the horizon, and also the moon. Now, if you look at the declination values for the central axis line, which is the red one, you can see there that astronomically, uh, the sun's declination at solstice is plus or minus 21 and a bit. At equinox is near enough to zero. So nothing there to see in terms of solar alignment. Not obvious. Also, the declination of the moon. Uh, no maximum declination or a major limit of the moon declination, which you would expect to see as a 28, 29, plus or minus. So nothing in the moon declination either. So something else was going on, um, which posed the next question. We can simulate these things now using astronomical packages and blending uh, imagery into them. And the sunrise on the avenue is occurring in early April, late August. Now that may or may not have been significant to the users of the site. And when we look at solar alignment, we raise questions then about solar cosmology, solar cult, deified sun, as in the case of Newgrange or Mays Howe, for example. Uh, what kind of ceremonies would have taken place, if any? And are there seasonal links tied into perhaps the ending of the harvest and the celebration in a post-harvest period before the onset of winter. So in the solar sense, although the declinations didn't indicate any date of importance, they're the kind of questions I would ask. When it comes to the night sky, which was the next obvious way of looking at the site, we take into account precession. We know the date of the site. We knew it was a couple of centuries just before year zero. So that allows us then to factor in precession, which has a considerable effect on what stars will appear where on the horizon over time. And manipulating the site imagery into um, Stellarium or other kinds of packages allows us to simulate, you know, what might have happened in prehistory. 
And it was my inference that in prehistory, at this time, the rising Pleiades would have been above the avenue for several months, from late August to early November. And that that could have been significant in a, in a ritual sense, post-harvest, pre-winter. And I've written up about the Pleiades and culture as many others have, and that's in my reference list too. But what fascinates me is that you're in the circle, you're in the center. It's a sacred space, perhaps. It is a ritual space. And in the slot trench, you have a fire and you have from late August to early November, the rising of the Pleiades, which by the way, you don't ever see on the horizon. The Pleiades being a faint cluster needs to have risen a few degrees before you actually see it. And the simulation would allow me to show that as well. So there was a theory which the archaeologists jumped on. <laughs> and um, I said, hold on, it's a theory. Uh, but no, they bought it. And I couldn't stop their enthusiasm. <laughs> but anyway, um, these are all theoretical perspectives and plausible inferences based on good data and good science. There's a different view looking in where the um, archaeological company I worked with up on the project reconstructed the monument to show how it is palisaded in a sense and how it might have looked in prehistory. Uh, and they know that that is the case from all of the vegetative remains that were discovered in the soil, including, by the way, decorative floral uh, wild roses. So it seems as if this was a revered site as I said before, archaeologically and chemically clean, no habitation, no burials, probably therefore reserved for assembly, ritual and gathering at auspicious times of the year. And the final slide there is really just to convey to you Liz Mullen enclosure from a cosmological, from an ancient cosmology perspective. It is now widely understood that in prehistory, based on anthropological and ethnographical information, that people regard the world they live in as a tripartite world. By that I mean, you have the lived in landscape, you have the underworld into which all celestial bodies set, out of which all celestial bodies will rise, except for polar stars, of course, certain polar stars. And then you have the overhead dome which is the other world, which is the perspective, you know, that people in prehistory would have grasped as being the dome studded by sky objects, which moved seasonally, uh, rose and set on the horizon. And I argue a lot and have written a lot about the importance of the horizon as being a liminal feature out of which and because of which the astronomy and the apparent astronomy of sun rising and sunset, Pleiades rising and setting, the moon rising and setting, that the horizon needs to be considered also as a domain of power. And that is my ending of my talk. So thank you for listening. And my references are at the end, which I think Andy will circulate to you. So happy for questions. Thank you very much indeed, Frank. That's yeah, absolutely, very uh, interesting. absolutely fantastic. Uh, very yeah. interesting. A lot of food for thought there. Uh, before we go over to the panel, can I just uh, ask you a couple of questions, yep. uh, Frank? Yep. Um, this one came in um, it's on my phone, so apologies for that. Um, Robin Edgar of the um, Irish Megalithic Research Group mm -hmm. says, uh, what do you think of, my, of his and other researchers' hypotheses that solar eclipses are represented in the megalithic art of uh, Lough Crew, is it? Nauth and Douth. Well, um, my view on that would be, and I would be very much with uh, scholars of megalithic art, like, you know, Professor Marisha Sullivan and, um, uh, and, a few, uh, and some others that I know. Um, we obviously have no record of what was intended. And the meaning of megalithic art is a hugely contentious subject. In some parts of Western Europe, um, there are clear indications on some of the engravings where they are that the art represents anthropomorphic form, or it can represent, for example, 
implements used like spears, stone tools, axes. There are a few examples of that. In the Irish tradition, uh, apart from one stone at Nouth, which George Ogan thought was representative of a human face in a sort of a vague kind of a way, um, outside of K52 at Nouth, which I illustrated, as being a very good example of representational art with meaning, which could be astral in its uh, association. The idea of eclipse, um, I'm very firmly with many astronomers on this one, um, that prehistoric people, unless they engaged in long-term keeping of astronomical records, there is no possibility that they could have predicted eclipses, in my view, at that time. Right. That would be my strong view on that one at that time. Okay. Um, actually, I've just noticed that Robin's actually in the chat. Hi, Robin. Thank you for joining us. Um, I don't know whether you can see the chat window, Frank. Um, yep. Yeah. If you, uh, there's, a, there's a further question from Robin. Yep. Um, I don't know whether you can see that. Uh, beginning, does Dr. Prendergast yep. agree that... Yeah, okay. Um, I mean, it is a, a theory. Um, what I like about K52 at now is that there are complementary um, strands to the idea that they are depicting or transferring what we call in cultural astronomy cosmovision down onto the stone. And it's almost as if they are imbuing their worldview onto the face of that particular stone. Um, if you look at the individual motifs on K52, they do occur on many, many other stones, but not arranged in the sequence that they are found on that particular stone. So K52 is extremely important. Taking that forward, you then ask the question, can any of those symbols be representative of solar um, elements? You know, the sun disk, the lunar disk, the lunar phase, um, even star symbols, you know, because you look at the sky and you see something that twinkles and it's kind of almost jagged. It is conceivable, but it can't be argued, I think, very strongly. And, you know, it, it's, it's up to the, I think it's up to the individual as to what they want to see in the art. Um, but I would be fairly secure, as other eminent astronomers who have looked at K52, I would be reasonably secure in, in, in saying that that particular stone is representing the sky and the lunar synodic cycle, uh, which is so obvious and it is so easy uh, yeah. to observe. And Mark, you can measure your time, by the way, to about two days of accuracy in the synodic cycle without okay. difficulty. And I've tested a couple of friends of mine just to try and sort of say, where in the month do you think we are? And invariably, within a day or two, they're right. So yes. as a fundamental timekeeper, uh, the moon is certainly the prime body in the sky. As regards all of the other art, um, there are so many theories and so many ways of looking at it. I think it's best to leave it to the individuals. Yes, indeed. Right. I, don't ha I do not have a monopoly on interpretation. <laughs> okay, thank you. We have another question from uh, Elena uh, here. Um, who says, could it be possible that the quartz stones were transparent enough to let the light pass into the chamber without being removed? Keith, our resident geologist, has already pointed out that the uh, the vast majority of quartz is opaque and white. Isn't that right, Keith? Yeah, that's correct, yeah. That, yeah. That's correct, yeah. Um, no, I mean, I mean, if you hold up a piece of quartz, unless you've, unless you've taken a, a section, you know, as in, you know, for a microscope analysis, um, it is opaque. Absolutely is. But mm. what is interesting about quartz is that in low levels of light, it appears to glow. Mm. And its, its mm. brightness just absolutely is stunning in, in, in slightly darkened conditions. Yeah. Uh, there's another interesting thing I did. Um, I was photographing um, uh, gyps, uh, another geological sample, which is white, and, and also quartz, and I had, had it on the table, and I had my camera looking down on it in autofocus mode, and the camera couldn't focus because the sensors were penetrating the upper levels of the stone. 
and the oh. zoom it, it continued to zoom in and out as i was trying to put <laughs> i had to revert to manual wow and that was a revelation that, wow. that was a revelation Absolutely. yeah so uh, you should, someone should try that and verify it for me sometime but um, <laughs> That'd be an interesting experiment to do yes yeah Definitely. it was and um yeah. so in terms of the cultural symbolism of quartz and its ritual importance that is well known and it associates with so many monuments in terms of perhaps a, a burial and um, but it can also symbolize a lot of other things and the way it's used at newgrange and at nowth which is the sister there are three mega tombs in the bowen valley uh, nowth entrance has a lot of quartz on both of the entrances there are two past two two chambers at nowth newgrange is only one but the amount of quartz at newgrange far exceeds anything found at any site mm. that i know of yeah yeah because you say about the quartz being very white um uh, they they believe that also in in, in Wiltshire on Salisbury Plain and all that, the underlying soil is mainly chalk. Yeah. And of course, when they did their burial mounds, they would be bright white, so they yes. could be seen from quite a long distance. Absolutely. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So there probably is some sort of link there. Um, yeah. That yeah. the whiteness has some sort of like a, a meaning to. Um, like I said, also acts like a beacon because on the ridgeway they had a, a series of burial mounds yeah. that, of course, would have gleamed out white. Yeah. Um, on the top of the on, on top of the ridge, so it. Uh, sure. Yeah. It. Uh, yeah. It, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's just amazing to sort of like try and fathom what these people were thinking, as you said. It's uh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so. There's a couple of comments coming up here about um, just solar eclipses in general. Mm. Um, uh, what I should do is distinguish between the ability to predict a solar eclipse in prehistory, which I would refute, as against if they observed or witnessed a solar eclipse phenomenon, then perhaps that could have been transferred as something special down onto stone. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Lou, I think, did you have a question? Well, I, I, I had a thought. A fascinating presentation. I appreciate your your research attention to detail. Um, I've been uh, to Newgrange, uh, not on the uh, solstice, but they they would flip the switch and the ch chambers would light up. You know the, yeah. that kind of thing. But my the thought that I had was um, on on your last set of slides, trying to um, understand the alignments for this uh, wood hinge type structure. Uh, and you mentioned the Pleiades. Mm -hmm. So, uh, <clears throat> Samhain was a celebration that was tied to by the ancient Celts, right? Which was tied into the, the uh, Pleiades uh, crossing the meridian being opposite the sun. Is this uh, is is there any thought that this could be related to uh, to this cross quartal holiday? Well, you mentioned a few things there, like um, in a calendrical sense, and the ancient calendar can only be verified or substantiated, as in the divisions of the year, you know, into the the, the so-called Celtic festivals, you know, sound lunas and all of that. Um, they really are understood to have emerged in the late Iron Age, early medieval period. Certainly not in the time of Newgrange that we know. And there is no evidence for it. And generally speaking, scholars who have studied the astronomy and the monuments collectively, and I've looked at this as well, would say that in the Neolithic, in the Bronze Age, we cannot propose that there was any kind of calendar in use in those periods of prehistory. The Celtic calendars, as they're so-called, and divisions of the year around those dates in question, uh, they emerge in the early records and annals around the late Iron Age and into the beginnings of the early medieval, which is also when you get writing beginning to appear in Ireland especially. But what's, what's interesting too is in the writings of Caesar, 
who had contact with the Druids in Britain, um, their evidence would show that they were celebrating. And here you're talking about 100 BC. So it makes my point that in the time of the Druids, uh, there was certainly a calendar system. And interestingly, um, the Druids are also known to have counted or measured time, not by days, but by nights. Ah, interesting. Yes. And th that is written down by the scribes of Caesar at that time, who were in contact with the Druids. There's also contact between Ireland and the Druids. There was a famous centre in Anglesey in Wales, and in Wales, there was a Druidic centre to which Irish are certainly known to have gone because certain artefacts from Ireland have been found in Anglesey so that you can attribute a journey made from here to there. So people were in contact with the Druids at that time. So you're talking about 100 BC, 200 BC, there or thereabouts. Um, what's interesting too is this notion of Celtic. Um, we are... Celtic linguistically, but we are not Celtic racially. Mm. There's a big statement. Mm. And the Celtic language, of which Ireland is just one of a whole grouping, um, is certainly well understood. But the Celts themselves, as a mid-European race, um, certainly never came here. But Celtic influence are certainly here. And that's indicative of trade and exchange and contact. Right. So you get Iron Age, you know, Halstead, uh, decoration on swords and scalbar, yeah. all that sort of stuff in Europe. And the same stuff appears here. And it indicates that there is trade and exchange and contact going on, as you would expect. Mm. Uh, but from a Celtic, to label us as Celtic is actually a little bit of a misnomer, I think. Hmm. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Oh, um, we, we make a lot of money on it, so don't knock it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, we were talking about, uh, as you said, the the uh, second uh, part of your uh, uh, presentation was about sort of like a wooden hinge. Um, well, of course, we've got the same sort of thing with um, uh, Stonehenge. Um, yes. We all, everybody sort of like associates Stonehenge with the standing stones that are still there now. Yeah. But that, but that, and that's what they associate as being the monument. But the monument to the landscape extends far beyond that, and you go uh, two or three miles um, to, I think it's the northwest or yep. east, uh, and you got um, a place called Durrington. I know. And there yeah. they found yeah. a massive yeah. henge which oh, predated, enormous. yeah, yep. which pre predated. Yep. Um, Stonehenge, That's and right. again, that was a wooden <coughs> hinge. It was. And <coughs> also Stonehenge, where they put the lintels uh, on the actual standing stones and that, they actually used wood-making techniques. They used mortars and... That's and absolutely everything. right, yeah. 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 It, which is astonishing. Yeah. Which is astonishing. But um, what's important about these landscapes and archaeological complexes is that they are multi-phase. Yeah. They don't yeah. arise instantly with the click of a yeah. finger. They have a time depth of many hundreds of years. And Stonehenge being a classic, the more they dig, the yeah. more further back they go. And what's also interesting about Stonehenge is that it was a place of gathering and people, it was a destination. It was the go-to place, yeah. especially they think at winter solstice. And that's very useful evidence because of the way that the depositions are analyzed and the, you know, the feasting that went on. It, all the evidence is in the ground and you get more and more retrieved mm -hmm. evidence to show that. And um, the important uh, parallel for that is that we can apply that kind of thinking to say that at Newgrange, people gathered probably seasonally as they do today, which is fantastic. And Liz Mullen, probably no different. These would have been places for, you know, local communities. Interestingly, with population, um, I'm often asked the question, what was the population of Ireland in 3000 BC? And I had done my own very primitive investigation, but more serious scientific excavation came out <clears throat> with a figure of about a half a million in the Neolithic at that time. 
But if you think about it, 3000 BC is the Neolithic, say the middle. Human habitation goes back a further 6,000 years mm. before that, mm. Mm. which is astonishing. Yeah. Um, yes. So you have what are called Mesolithic, um, you know, hunter gatherer societies who obviously traveled as the ice sheets retreated. So you're now getting into glacial uh, and post glacial analysis of landscape, which is an amazing subject. And as you see the ice sheets retreat and the climate warms, uh, people are moving northwards and beginning to settle what, what was previously uninhabitable terrain. There were also obviously much lower sea levels because ice had been abstracted by the ice sheets. And interestingly, I was um, looking at the latest project on glacial uh, covering of uh, Ireland in particular, but Britain as well. There's a project that was run by Sheffield University called Brit Ice and it incorporated Irish and British geologists. And if you look at the old geology books, you see that Ireland was covered to a depth of two kilometers of ice. Wow. Yeah. Now, hold on. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah. And, uh, but not, not, not all of the island was covered. Mm. The latest research would show you that Ireland maximum uh, ice sheet thickness was about 900 meters but the total island was covered and offshore as well, going out onto the continental shelf. So it was a much bigger ice field, but not as thick, yeah. probably about half. And mm. the geological evidence is amazing because there's about, let's say a dozen ice-free peaks um, above the 900 meter contour where there are no scratch marks. But as soon as you go below that level, you see scratch marks from the ice sheets yeah. evident in the bedrock. Yeah. And this proves the thickness of the ice sheet at that time. So that's a comparatively mm -hmm. recent find. What yeah. I find it's, fascinating. Yeah. It's and, Stonehenge when they did geophysics uh, surveys. Yeah. They found these, what were seemed to be sort of like, they thought they were linear features and that they've been man-made. But when they scraped it off, they found that these grooves were sort of like a bit wibbly wobbly. And they, um, in the end, after investigation, they decided that was caused in the chalk by yeah. the um, ice sheets um, that covered that area. Yeah. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it, um, it, the, the ice did come down a long, long way. Um, okay. And as you said, but we also had the land bridge between yeah. uh, Britain and Europe. Um, mm -hmm. But um, I mean, I noticed the, um, uh, uh, it, <laughs> what we, Keith has just put up a, a picture of what is known as Woodhenge. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, that is, that's not the henge I was talking about. Mm -hmm. That was actually a massive um, hut. It was a, sort of like a hall. <clears throat> um, and that was all the post holes. And that is just mm -hmm. next door to um, Durrington Walls, which is where the big henge was. Um, and, of course, the Big Henge was a meeting place. Um, as you said, mm -hmm. the people would congregate there. And yes. They'd have big feasts, big festivals mm -hmm. um, because of the middens, they could tell. And they, they knew they, there was lots of um, pigs, cattle, bones and things like that. And exactly. they could tell by the bones how old the, the, the animals were. Yep. So they knew when they were meeting there. But that is, like I said, that's Woodhenge that's behind Keith. Mm -hmm. um, we, but in, in the middle of that, in the centre of that, because that's all where the post holes were, mm -hmm. um, it was a very dense um, uh, <laughs> building, but in the centre was the burial of a small child. Um, exactly, yeah. yeah. And um, the, <clears throat> um, and like I said, Durrington Walls was a massive, they've even got the, this is where people lived when they come to actually build their monuments mm. and it was where they think that these people resided while they were actually building um stonehenge because there's no evidence near stonehenge of any um domestic places um mm. homes or anything like that so right. <clears throat> yeah I, I could go on for ages about it. <laughs> well actually uh, we <clears throat> i'd love you to Taz, but we need to start yeah. drawing things to a close yeah. as times I get agree. on um so we'll have to have uh, a part two we, as you can see, Frank, on the screen, um, a thanks from Robin. Um, so um, thank you, Robin, for being here. Uh, thank you. And um, I'm really enjoying being part of your Facebook group, the, um, the Irish Megalithic Research Group. 
very interesting it is. So thank you for that. <coughs> We've got a few other thanks um, from uh, Gerard says, thanks for a uh, fascinating presentation. Um, and, um, and I think everybody has thoroughly enjoyed that. Yeah. So a thank big you, Frank. thank you to Frank. And panel, I think we should give yeah. Frank yeah. A, yeah. an appreciated <coughs> round of applause. Yeah. Hey. So oh, thank thanks for putting up with me. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for being with us tonight, Frank. It's very kind of you to, to spare the time to be with us. No, delighted. Uh, the um, the references Frank were referring to. If you look in the description of this video, the references are in there. Good. So if you want to investigate these these subjects further, there's plenty of reading material that Frank has kindly supplied uh, for us in, in those links. So um, so there we are, and uh, and that's it really. I'd like to say uh, obviously a big thanks to the panel tonight. I'd like to thank you, the viewers, for joining us for our one thousand subscriber special. And I think you'll agree with me that it has been very special indeed having Frank here and uh, and listening to uh, amazing things. Yeah. Um, yeah. We will be back next week when Keith will be telling us about criminal astronomers. Da, da, da. <laughs> uh, so, um, so Not for very long. Most of them gone away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, and I even get a thank you from Robin. So um, my absolute pleasure, Robin. Um, I'm glad that uh, you could join us and, uh, you know, don't be a stranger. Do drop into Space Oddities because we cover everything to do with the universe on Earth um, as it is in heaven, if you like. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs>